So this is early childhood. Generally, we say about age three to six. Sometimes there's a little bit in there from two-year-olds, which would be considered a toddler. Um, but six is usually the cutoff for early childhood, and then middle childhood follows after this. So this gives you an idea about how quickly the child is growing. Um, keep in mind that the second year of life in a two-year-old, there are two different ages. Um, the first year of life would be birth to one, and then we have a one-year-old. The second year of life would be one to age two, and then we have a two-year-old. Um, so third year of life would be a two-year-old to a three-year-old. Fourth year of life would be a three-year-old to a four-year-old. So keep that um, kind of difference in your mind. So we say that the brain is about 25% of an adult size brain at birth. And then uh, by the time the child is three, that brain is up to about 75 to 80% of a child's um, or an adult size brain. <clears throat> in the frontal lobe, we have abstract thinking, problem solving, there's motor function, the ability to remember facts, tell stories, that's all associated with the frontal lobe. The temporal lobe, we see speech, auditory processing, hearing, behavior, emotions, short and long-term memory, um, fear, the whole fight or flight, being able to retain facts as part of the temporal lobe. The parietal lobe is sensory information, taste, touch, smell, temperature. The occipital lobe is anything to do with vision, uh, recognizing letters, knowing left from right, and then the cerebellum is balance, coordination, attention, rhythm, um, being able to kick and throw a ball, jumping on a foot, riding a bike, and so forth. A child at this age, on average, should be getting about 11 to 13 hours of sleep. So let's say if a child had to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, then they should be in bed by 7 o'clock the night before. Uh, generally speaking, we don't see a lot of sleep problems in children this age, um, but we do see some things uh, occur, insomnia, uh, narcolepsy, nightmares or night terrors. Uh, night terrors, on average, only happen in about 3 to 6% of children. Um, they usually happen in kids ages 4 to about 12, but they can be uh, reported in babies as young as 18 months, and they're just slightly more common among boys than they are among girls. Um, if there is a family member who has had them, they're about 80% more likely to have had them. Um, if they sleepwalk, that increases the chances. Um, but sometimes just being overtired, sick, stressed, taking new medicine, being in a strange environment, not getting enough sleep or too much caffeine can all be associated with night terrors. Night terrors usually happen about two or three hours after a child falls asleep. And when the child moves from the deepest sleep of non-REM to a lighter REM sleep, this transition is usually a smooth one, but sometimes the child becomes upset and frightened, and that fear reaction is a night terror. Other things that can be associated with sleep is weight, um, social problems or interactions with peers, stress in the environment. Um, so those are some associations that we see with sleep but we want to encourage about 12 hours a night of sleep. Proper nutrition at this stage of life is important to their future and their overall well-being. Uh, we see many risk factors that are associated with uh, your child increasing in weight. Um, diets such as eating high uh, calorie foods, fast foods, baked goods, vending machines, that type of thing will increase it. Lack of exercise, we talk about this a lot today because our children are on their uh, electronic devices and even at age you know, three, four, five, we see them on the electronics. So they're not getting enough exercise. Uh, family factors sometimes, so there's a hereditary component to weight. Um, psychological factors, um, increase of stress, that can uh, increase the risk of obesity. Some children overeat to cope with problems or to deal with emotions such as stress. Uh, socioeconomic factors, having limited resources or limited access to supermarkets. Uh, as a result, people in low income areas may buy convenience foods that don't spoil quickly, such as frozen meals, crackers, cookies, 
Um, there might not be a safe place in the neighborhood for the kids to be outside playing or exercising. Um, and then we see complications with physical, social, and emotional well-being. Um, some physical complications, kids can end up with type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, asthma, sleep disorders. Um, there's a low self-esteem for social and emotional complications, being bullied, behavior and learning problems. This can all lead to depression. So we want to try and limit sugar and sweetened beverages, provide plenty of fruits and vegetables, eat family meals as often as possible, um, adjusting portion size. So it's a tablespoon per year of life. So one portion for a two-year-old would be two tablespoons of whatever it is that they're eating. And that would be considered a portion. <clears throat> All right. Malnutrition is something that we still struggle with here and across the world. Uh, 47 million children under the age of five uh, and are, are considered malnourished in some form. 14.3 uh, of that 47 million are severely malnourished and 144 million are stunted in their growth due to malnutrition. And then 38.3 million are considered overweight or obese. So there's various forms of malnutrition. We have undernourishment, micronutrient related mal malnutrition, uh, and then obesity and overweight would be the flip side to that. So we still uh, see an issue with kids getting the proper nutrients um, we break undernutrition into four parts. There's wasting, stunting, underweight, uh, and then deficiencies in vitamins and minerals. Those that are undernourished are more vulnerable to death and disease. A low weight for height is known as wasting. It usually indicates that there is a severe weight loss because a person has not had enough food to eat. Um, they might have an infectious disease, <clears throat> such as uh, something related to diarrhea, which causes them to lose weight. A child who is moderately or severely wasted has an increased risk of death, but treatment is still possible. And then if they have that low height um, for their age, this is known as stunting and as a result of chronic or recurrent undernutrition, <clears throat> uh, usually associated with poor uh, socioeconomic statuses, uh, poor maternal health, nutrition, frequent illnesses, or inappropriate infant and young feeding can result in stunting of a child's physical growth. We want to encourage exercise as often as possible to keep the kids active and moving, and that will help to maintain their, their healthy weight, which is what we try, strive for, and decrease the chance that they will become overweight or obese. Gross motor skills is anything large motor movement. So you can see this takes us back into infancy and gives you an idea of some of the gross and fine motor skills that they should be able to do at this stage of their life. These are some of the things that are associated with uh, six months to a year or seven months to a year, so the second half of the first year. So these are all approximations again, of things that we want to see as they develop their motor skills. from about a year and a half to three years is what we see here. So we wanna encourage this outdoor 
time to improve their gross motor skills. So lots of time in playgrounds and running around outside can help improve their gross motor development. Many kids are in preschool during these four and five year old years. So some of these things they'll learn to do at preschool, such as getting along with people outside the family um, and interacting with them, drawing circles and squares. They should be doing a lot of that in um, preschool as well as like cutting, learning to cut on the dotted line, um, being able to write their name. Uh, the more information you can give them, the better off they are in terms of who they are. Um, kids get lost all, all the time. You know, it just takes a second for a parent to turn away and the child is gone. So teaching them their name and their address, even at a younger age than five, can help them um, identify who they are and you know give that information hopefully to somebody that will help them. The jumping, hopping, skipping, they'll do that in gym class. Um, generally speaking, the kindergarten class will be tested on some of this to evaluate their gross motor development. <clears throat> so much of this is going to be learned in, in preschool. There's a higher rate of injuries during this time, but mostly due to the high activity volume that kids have. Kids are always on the go, 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 running, moving, um, and so they're more at risk, obviously, for injury. The most common cause of injury are motor, motor vehicle accidents. So this can result in many different ways, um, such as, you know, kids running and not watching where they're going. So they're running in the street. If kids are on bikes, they often cross streets without looking. Um, so we see those types of accidents. And then the other type would be, uh, you know, utilizing car seats properly. So in the state of Illinois, kids are required to be in a car seat until the age of eight or 80 pounds. And so boost, booster seat is what they would be in up until then. So there's different stages that kids have to be in the car seat for. They used to say, uh, keep the kids rear facing through until they're one. And then once they're one, you can turn that car seat around. And now they're saying they want kids to be rear facing until age two. And so some of the car seats have uh, been made adjustable so that they slide back to allow more room for the feet um, of the child. But they want the kids rear facing until age two is what, what they're saying now. So those are ty different types of motor vehicle accidents. And then when kids are on bikes, they need to be in helmets too. That's, that's a law in Illinois for them to have a helmet on when they're bike riding. Uh, so we see um, um, disease in, in a lot of our developing countries is more of a problem than um, just injuries from being outside and playing type of thing. But still, there's, there's some uh, injury rates in developing nations as well. A lot of those kids are, you know, off working, not being supervised, um, not wearing appropriate clothing or shoes, and that's going to increase their chance of injuries. In the past, we have said that kids understand their gender by the age of um, six. So the kid, if they're a boy, they'll know that they're going to be a boy for the rest of their life. If they're a girl, they'll know that they're going to be a girl for the rest of their life. Obviously, we see some changes in that now. So these are just a few definitions, gender identity, gender roles, gender typing. Um, they can give us a better sense of how to understand gender. We shoot for potty training um, to be accomplished around the age of three, three and a half. Um, although some kids do take a little bit longer, some learn a little bit quicker. Um, if we can encourage, you know, positive um, reactions around potty training, that can help. You really can't force a child to learn. They have to want to learn and to be ready to learn. If you try and start it too early, um, it's oftentimes met with a lack of success. Uh, there can be ways to identify the child is ready uh, when they're staying dry for longer during the day uh, than they used to, when they're having regular bowel movements at the same time every day. Um, if they're asking to use the toilet or 
wear underwear, that can be a sign that they're ready. Um, so there's you know things that you can look for uh, that signs that your child will give you. This little Toy Story character at the top is like a like a sticker chart type thing. So every time the child you know uses the toilet successfully, you color in a number or put a sticker on it or something. Um, and when the child has the chart filled up, then you give them some kind of reward. So this is based off of like Skinner's um, positive reinforcement. So in infancy, we saw Piaget's sensory motor stage. Now that we're in early childhood, we see the pre-operational stage. So this is, goes from about two or three to about six or seven. Um, the child starts to be more curious, ask more questions. Um, we see a lot of egocentric thinking that occurs during this stage. Um, and that helps us to uh, take the child to the next level in terms of learning um, and what we present to them and you know how we represent the world around them. They will start to mimic a lot of that in their drawings and storytelling and just general play that they do. This reversibility concept is um, present but slow to develop at this stage. Um, so reversible mental actions that allow children to do mentally what they formerly did physically, um, though they're going to struggle with that a little bit th at this stage. Um, some symbolic fun function is their ability to mentally represent an object that's not present. So we see a lot of this symbolic function in their play, their pretend play, their imagination. Um, they're very egocentric. They only see things from their point of view. They do not have the ability to see things from, from others' points of view. So you will never ever win an argument with a three-year-old or a four-year-old. Um, they just don't have the ability to see things from that other perspective. <clears throat> they don't understand uh, like relationships, and this is where some of that lack of reversibility comes in. You know, they can tell you who their parents are, who their sisters are, who their cousins are, but they don't understand that reverse relationship. They don't understand that um, their parent has another child, and that child is their sister. Um, they don't understand that the grandparents um, have children, and that those parents are, or those children are their parents. So that you know, reverse relationship is what they really struggle with um, at this stage of life. When they hear stories, then they go act out that, that story. They're using that symbolic function and that um, intuitive thought that goes into that. So if you read them the story of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and then they are playing with their you know, friends afterwards, and they're acting out that story and you know, maybe changing some of the language around that's, that's their symbolic fun function and intuitive thought at play that Piaget talks about. Um, as they move from the pre-operational stage into the next one, which would be concrete, which we'll talk about in middle childhood, you'll see their centration and their conservation start to develop. Um, they're, they're limited here um, with the pre-operational thought as to how far they can go with centration and conservation. So we'll examine those more in middle childhood. So because Piaget and Vygotsky were born in the same year, their work is often compared to each other, although they have two differing um, views and perspectives on psychology. Vygotsky comes from a social cultural um, and places more emphasis on you know, the interactions with their social environment uh, in learning, and, and Piaget does not. You know, he thinks that that natural curiosity um, is what's going to help kids learn and grow. That cognitive development is what they focus on with Piaget's uh, theory. So there's not a right or wrong. Um, you know, they're both right in their own way, and they both contribute to the development of the child and understanding the development of a child, um, but they have two different different perspectives. So there's a 90 second uh, video here that just goes through quickly um, some of the compare and contrast to Piaget and Vygotsky. The ZPD or zone of proximal development is one of Vygotsky's terms. So if you um, 
want to get a child to understand a higher concept, they start with a base level learning. This base level learning um, is their starting point, and we want them to you know, climb the ladder higher. So when they reach the top of the ladder, they've learned the new concept. That space in between or those ladder rungs in between is their ZPD. So as they are introduced to the new topic, you know, they'll need a lot of help. And so that first ladder rung is going to, you know, be the teacher right there helping, hand holding, walking them through. As they climb each rung of the ladder, they will need less and less help. Um, and that's the scaffolding that's taking place. So there's a short video here um, from Vygotsky that you can take a look at. The criticism to Vygotsky's theory is the lack of stages. There is not age-related changes that are addressed. Um, he does not describe how changes in socio-emotional capabilities contribute to cognitive development. Some feel that he overemphasizes the role of language in thinking, but, uh, you know, Vygotsky, born in 1896, died in 1934, had a rather shortened life. So had he lived longer, you know, Piaget, born in 1896, died in 1980. If he had all those years that Piaget did, there's a good chance that, you know, the, some of this would have been addressed, especially the stages of development. So that is one thing that psychologists like a lot is to say, you know, at this stage or this age of life, this is what should be happening. And Vygotsky lacks that. This idea of information processing um, helps children at this stage of life to be able to interpret their surroundings and understand um, what is going on around them, books that they're reading, uh, directions and rules that they have to follow. Um, it just helps them to process all that information and better understand um, how to respond and how to deal with the information that they're learning about. Having better sustained attention and being able to focus and have extended engagement, we'll see increases in this throughout. This will help them to process information even better. Um, <clears throat> memory, short-term individuals can retain up to 30 seconds with no rehearsal. So that's any age. That's not just specific to kids at this age, but short-term memory, say, is 12 to 30 seconds. Um, and so we'll do some assessment of children at this age to make sure that they don't have any uh, learning disabilities um, and that their short-term and long-term memory are on track. Autobiographical memory here is information about their own life and their experiences and events that have happened that they're able to retain. So there's been a lot of research that's been poured into this and there's a, a good amount of information that's accurate and you know children are remembering things um, as they happened. So we see some reliability that's associated with these autobiographical memories, usually starting at around the age of three is what we see for memory development. So this is another one of Erickson's stages, initiative versus guilt. If that autonomy and um, versus shame is, has developed appropriately and they built that independence in the last stage, then they'll be able to take the initiative in this one and be more of self-starters, which is what we want them to do. We want them to have that self-confidence um, and self-esteem to be able to, you know, be more independent and, and do things on their own. So that's what we strive for at this stage of life. Piaget also has some uh, information on moral development and moral reasoning. So he broke it down into three parts. The um, four to seven years, seven to 10, and 10 plus. So we start to understand a little bit more as we progress through each phase. Generally speaking, this early childhood stage 
kids don't see that rules are changeable. They think that, you know, that's the rule and you have to follow it and, you know, that's all there is to it. There is no negotiation or anything um, that goes on at this stage. We'll start to see some of that as we get to the transitional and the autonomous stage. I mentioned a few slides ago that gender um, seems to be kind of set in stone that kids know if they're a boy, they're going to be a boy, and if they're a girl, they're going to be a girl by age six. So here you can see that's called gender constancy. Um, but again, this is what we've you know said for many years as to what happens. I, I'm sure we're going to see some changes in this language um, you know, as, as we start to do more research on gender and gender development of children. Usually by age three or so, they'll be able to say, yeah, I'm a boy or yeah, I'm a girl. Um, that's where we start to see the gender identity um, increase and occur. Um, social role theory um, is what kids understand from those that are um, around them. So, you know, watching fathers and what their, you know, gender role is, you know, what they do as a guy or as a man watching women, their moms, what they do, um, that helps to give them an idea of what the different gender roles are about and what people play. Um, the psychoanalytic theory, this is Freud, so the Oedipus or Electric Complex would be part of this. So this would be in his uh, phallic stage, which would be the preschool or early childhood stage. So the Oedipus Complex is the, the strong attraction that a child has to the opposite sex, so a boy is strongly attracted to the mother um, and would want the father eliminated or out of the picture. And for the Electra complex, the daughter has a strong attach attachment to the father, um, but Freud puts everything in sexual terms. So Freud would say that there's a sexual attraction to that the son has to the mother or the daughter has to the father um, and wants all that attention for themselves. <clears throat> so they're um, once kids are out of this preschool stage, they tend to outgrow this stage. And then the social cognitive theory would be part of um, what we talked about with uh, Piaget and Vygotsky. So we look at parenting styles again during this um, stage, during early childhood, and we want the child to have some you know, limits placed on them, but we also want to teach them. So we strive to we should strive for parents to be authoritative. They're gonna encourage that child to be independent, but they're gonna place limits on that child. So there's teaching that goes along with it. An authoritarian type parent demands obedience and respect, um, but there's not a lot of teaching that goes into play. Like they say yes or no, but they don't give a reason or an explanation, and then the child you know, isn't really learning why they can or why they can't do something. Um, if parents are neglectful, they're not meeting the child's basic needs in life. Um, this can be, you know, a child that is always wearing dirty clothes, a child that doesn't take a bath. Um, as they get into school age, it could be a child that doesn't do their homework. That can be considered neglect. So neglect can um, come across in a variety of ways. An indulgent or permissive parent as a, child, a parent that gives gives into their child all the time, there's not a lot of rules set. Um, the child kind of makes the rules. Um, they're more of a friend to the child than they are a parent to the child. The discipline depends on culture in different parts of the world. Um, we don't see as much physical punishment or corporal punishment here, um, but it does still go on quite a bit in other parts of the world. Um, in Western culture, we tend to take this authoritative approach, use things more like time out and, you know, teach the child why they did something wrong rather than to just punish them. In Japanese culture, we uh, emphasize shame, they withdraw love. So different parts of the world are gonna focus on you know, discipline and punishment at this age a little bit different. Neglect is the most common type of abuse that children suffer, followed by physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, emotional abuse is in there too, but it's very difficult to, to prove. 
So that's why that's kind of listed. Uh, that's why I listed that one last. Um, although it happens more often than some of these others, because of its difficulty to prove, there's not a lot that we can do for children to um, be protected uh, when it comes to emotional abuse. Children that grow up in abusive households might see more of that difficult temperament in, in them. They are unusually aggressive. We see this more often in poverty, unemployment, single motherhood, um, and then if there's a history of abuse, including spousal abuse. When it comes to co-parenting, there's a couple different models that can be followed. The strategic problem solving model um, looks just at the issues at hand. The behavioral aspects of your child's problems are highlighted, as is the co-parenting trouble spots. Um, as co-parents, hopefully you identify the problem and negotiate choices. Strategic problem solving directs each parent to resolve conflict through a careful approach, exchanging information about needs and priorities, building upon shared concerns, searching for solutions. Um, this is done without getting into your ex's emotional needs, wants, and desires. And then there's social psychological problem solving, which is more of an emotional way of resolving issues. This looks at your attitudes and the emotional reasons for co-parenting blind spots. While the psychological model um, assumes that parenting conflicts are bound to arise, it differs from that strategic one by focusing on the psychological factors that drive conflict and negotiate impasses. Talking with your ex using this model can be tough. Um, so sometimes the strategic one will work better. Um, but when we co-parent, you know, we want to work together to jointly raise the children, even if the parents aren't together. The more the parents are on board with one another, the better adjusted the child will be and they won't be able to pit each parent against each other either. A lot of parents have have to work today. You know, even if there's two parents in the household, both parents have to work. Um, so this can put a, a damper on, you know, being with the kids and, and child care and, and just the family time in general. Um, so we see some differences with that today. Um, we see more kids living apart, more kids being raised in single parent homes. Actually, the divorce rate is on the decline and has been for some time. Although there are still children that are in divorced families, and like I said on that co-parenting slide, if we can get these parents working together, that's going to help um, with emotional problems and um, you know the the well-being of the child or children in the household if the parents can work together. This just gives you a look at single parent households. So you can see the United States has the most single parent households with Japan having the least single parent households. There's different types of play that children have at this stage of life. In the infancy stage, we talked about parallel play where the kids or the babies would play side by side but not interact with each other. So we see changes in that as they reach this early childhood and they'll start to interact and play games and um, be able to follow rules and just engage with one another in a more constructive manner at this stage. This social play is important for this stage of development in learning communication, language, um, and being able to follow rules in, in games and understanding why we have rules. Um, engaging in this constructive play is gonna help increase their imagination and their creativity as they interact with one another. So all types of play here are important to their well-being and development at this stage. Obviously, we want to decrease the media that they're exposed to. Um, they shouldn't be watching more than an hour and a half to three hours a day, although that, you know, some say that that's rather high as well. So the least amount that we can get them um, involved with television or media or electronic devices, the better off they're going to be. Um, we want to uh, enc encourage that, you know, motor development skills and 
that's going to help them um, stay better fit as well. There are some positivity that comes along with uh, you know, media and television watching. They do increase language development, math skills sometimes if they're watching the proper amount of shows. There's a lot of good preschool shows out there that can help educate them. The Montessori approach is more common today with our preschools and or kindergarten. Uh, this is a more, uh, more freedom, more of the child's ability to kind of learn at their own pace and follow their own interests. So it's not as curriculum structured as what we see in a typical, you know, public school kindergarten type setting.